Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our panel on EU policy, what's on the horizon. My name is Alyssa Heath. I'm head of EU and UK policy with the Principles for Responsible Investment, and it's a real pleasure to be introducing today's discussion. I wanted to start by explaining what the panel will be about. We've taken some very deliberate decisions when designing this panel, and many of you will know that we have a very wide range of signatories to the PRI in Europe and beyond who are interested and engaging in European finance and European sustainable finance policy. But what we hear increasingly is that particularly those who are new to the agenda are struggling to get a foothold and to make sense of the overall landscape of EU sustainable finance policy. So this panel is designed to help the audience get that foothold to understand some of the key developments in EU policy and also to share some practical insights on how firms are starting to prepare. This is a very interactive panel and we strongly encourage you to share your questions uh, throughout. You have a Q&A option and we will make sure that there's a dedicated time with our brilliant panelists to run through some of those questions at the end. So please do use this as an opportunity to pick their brains and to learn from their experiences. Now, I will come to introducing our panel in just a moment. Uh, they are representing a, a wide range of financial institutions across different parts of the finance sector. And they represent both the European and the international perspectives, reflecting the increasing importance of EU regulation on a global level. But before I do that, because this is a very factual panel, we thought we would spend a few minutes laying out some of the milestones in sustainable finance regulation that we think the audience ought to be aware of. And so with that, uh, I'm going to talk you through a slide which shows a very stripped back version of some of those key milestones just now. So on the far left of your slide, you can see the EU action plan on financing sustainable growth, which is really where it all started for a lot of the policies that we're going to be talking about today. The EU action plan is uh, a framework for action. It, it's not necessarily a legislative instrument in its own right, but it sets out a series of things that the EU is doing on sustainable finance. And it's where you will find the original ideas behind the EU taxonomy the sustainability disclosures regulation, the suitability uh, requirements, uh, changes to fiduciary duty around ESG risk, the benchmarks regulation proposals, and the EU green bond standard, amongst other things. And these are all topics that will definitely come up in today's discussion. The first uh, regulation to enter force from the action plan was the benchmarks regulation, which governed uh, ESG disclosure rules for benchmark administrators and set out new categories or minimum standards for new categories of low carbon benchmark product. The other key development from uh, December of 2019 that I'd like to mention is the EU Green Deal. And this isn't specific to sustainable finance. The EU Green Deal is a whole economy transformation program and it's a leveling up of Europe's ambition on sustainable finance, on, on, on sustainability, I'm sorry. But sustainable finance is a key pillar within the European Green Deal. And it's because of the increased ambition on the European Green Deal that we have our next milestone. So by the end of 2020, we understand that the European Commission will be bringing forward a revised sustainable finance strategy. So taking the baseline that's already been established through the action plan on sustainable finance, but leveling it up to reflect the increased ambition in Europe on sustainability and on sustainable finance. Now, looking forward to 2021, we deliberately haven't focused in this slide on political agreements on formal ratification by the parliament, on uh, dates at which regulations enter into force, but not necessarily uh, for investors. What we've tried to do here is pick out the key things that are actions that an investor might need to take, proposals that we're expecting to come forward, or the finalization of rules that are currently being developed. So it's a little bit of a mix in 2021. We're expecting all three of those things to happen, but I'm just going to highlight a couple of things. Firstly, the new disclosure requirements that will affect investors in or around 2021. In March, we are expecting the first disclosures under the EU regulation on sustainability related disclosures in the financial services sector. These are expected to be high level disclosures reflecting what's in the negotiated text that's already in the public domain. 
but it's worth noting that there is detailed work going on on implementing rules and it's looking more likely that those rules won't be finalized until the middle of 2021. So I'm sure this is a topic that our panelists will come back to, but there is a sort of stage process for complying with the regulation on sustainability disclosures in 2021. I'd also like to highlight at the end of the year is when the first EU taxonomy disclosures at a product level will be required by firms who are offering eligible products. So those are the two key milestones uh, in terms of disclosure obligations that investors should be aware of. We're also expecting some more developments around uh, the proposals to amend fiduciary duties and processes around ESG risk management, and also the very important amendments around suitability tests and incorporating clients' sustainability preferences into the evaluation of which products may be suitable for them. Now we're expecting those at some point. I'm not yet clear what the deadline is. I'm hoping that one of my panel actually has better information on that and, and, and can share it uh, during the discussion. And then I also wanted to highlight the EU Green Bond Standard. This is something that's been under development for a number of years. There's been a proposal made by an expert group and the EU is working on what the next steps look like and particularly debating whether it should be a voluntary tool or perhaps established on a legislative basis. And then finally, just a couple of things to pick up on. In quarter one of 2020, we're expecting a revised NFRD, non-financial reporting directive. So these are the governing rules for European corporates on how they disclose on ESG and sustainability data. And that's been uh, under development for a number of years, but we're hoping to see quite a, a strong development in that space to really help to match the data needs that are coming from some of these uh, incoming investor regulations. And I also wanted to mention briefly the Sustainable Corporate Governance Initiative, uh, which has been committed to be developed in 2021. Uh, these are very simple sounding words, but fundamentally that's about looking at whether or not European corporates and potentially other types of actors as well could be uh, facing a mandatory due diligence requirement around their human rights and other possibly environmental implications. So that's a really fascinating one that, that again, I'm hoping we will be able to touch on. So with that, uh, with that very quick run through of the European policy landscape, I'd like to introduce my panel. And I'll be doing that in uh, alphabetical order. So first of all, we have Kerry Evans. Kerry is a managing director in the global policy team with BlackRock and is based in Brussels. We have Nadia Humphreys. She's a business manager in the sustainable finance solutions unit at Bloomberg. And it would be remiss of me not to point out that Nadia has just been appointed uh, a member of the platform on sustainable finance, the EU's new advisory body on all of these issues. We have Johanna Cobb, who is the Head of Responsible Investment with Zurich, and Karina Silberg, who is the Head of Sustainability with Elector. And Karina and I actually worked together in 2017 uh, on our organization's contribution to the EU high-level expert group. So Karina has a fantastic history on this agenda. And with that, I'm delighted to start letting my panelists speak. So I'm going to come to our asset owners first. And Johanna, I'd, I'd like to start with you. If you could uh, give us your firm's perspective, what do you think are the two, maybe three most important recent developments in European sustainable finance policy? Sure. Uh, thank you very much, Alyssa, and good morning to, to everyone. Um, I think, I mean, I probably won't, won't speak on behalf of all of Zurich Insurance, but more the asset owner perspective, because I'm heading the responsible investment uh, team and of course I'm very involved in, in monitoring regulation and the implementation thereof. And I think for us the most exciting things are really the taxonomy, that it does exist and that the EU is working on it. Of course we all know it will happen step by step, but we're very interested on climate change mitigation and adaptation, what will actually come out at the end of the year, which of the technical standards and thresholds that have been proposed last summer in a 400 page book will make it through and what everyone will ultimately opine on. So that's very exciting. Also the EU Green Deal as a whole, and as you have said, it doesn't only touch sustainable investment and finance, but is much broader, but as a transformational tool for the entire EU in many, many aspects um, that will hopefully be groundbreaking. So we're also very excited to see what will happen there and hope that it will um, help the sustainable investors by also attempting to fix a couple of the underlying challenges that we have in our real economy. And last but not least, what is keeping the team very busy at the moment is, of course, getting prepared for the sustainable uh, financial disclosure rules that will, that will affect us very, very much. 
and uh, they're complicated and uh, not as visible and predictable as they probably should be. But I'm sure we will speak about that a little bit later. Fantastic. And, and, and sorry again for the 400 pages. Um, now we also take some responsibility for that, I'm afraid. Um, Karina, could I come to you next? Uh, what do you see as, as the top issues for elections? Well, I mean, um, good morning, everyone. Also, and thank you for being here. Uh, um, I really want to say, first of all, hands down, because this massive momentum that's been created the last three years, that is the EU sustainable finance, is you know something that we warmly welcome and are kind of in awe of. And at the same time, to be frank, a little intimidated because of you know the speed, the scope, the level of detail and all the opportunities to get sort of involved and engaged with it. But to sort of mention the two, three most important things, I, I, I would have to reflect what Johanna was saying for Electa. I mean, the things that has direct impact on us is obviously the disclosure regulation. Uh, and we're a large occupational pension provider. So with our fiduciary responsibility, we welcome this you know, opportunity and guidance to make transparency very meaningful for our customers. Um, I would have to say taxonomy. As we'll give our analysts and PMs, you know, reference values to actually assess and track the share of and steer towards climate aligned investments in the portfolio. And I mean, all the efforts and focus that are on data, which of course for us as active investors is you know, the fundamental of the analysis. So anything that will make us get better access to more quality and meaningful ESG data is warmly welcome. And then, of course, I mean, time to the Green Deal. If we would see massive unlocking of sustainable investment opportunities that is fit for pension funds, that would, of course, be very nice. Fantastic. Thank you. And, and Kerry, you're, you're bringing a slightly different perspective to this as an as a international firm, a very large firm. Um, do you want to give us your, your top two to three issues that you're that you're yeah, absolutely. So um, thank you as well for having me and, and good morning to everybody. Um, I, I mean, I certainly agree with a lot of uh, what Johanna and, and Karina um, outlined there. I think there's a slightly different angle coming at it from an asset management perspective, where ultimately our job is to help asset owners, um, you know, like insurance companies or pension funds, um, but also a, a very wide and disparate retail investor base um, kind of uh, make some of their their long term investment decisions and, and asset allocation. So, from our perspective, I would say probably if I had to pick two, you know, very critical ones, it would be the SFDR and probably the MIFID suitability requirements. Um, I, I, that's not to take away anything from the taxonomy. I think that um, you know it's it's an enormous piece of work that is really um, you know revolutionary in a lot of ways, and I think it will help. Um, asset owners and 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 you know real economy firms make strategic investment decisions. Um, I think we will have a lot to do with um, you know ultimately helping uh, uh, people make investment decisions around it. And there's obviously a data exercise. But when I think of you know an asset manager's job to really provide um, services to to clients, I think the transparency that comes in uh, around the SFDR. Um, you know, around, around all investment products and, and, and portfolios, not just ones with dedicated sustainable objectives. Um, and then the idea that we're going to be building a distribution system that's more responsive to end investors sustainability choices, I think actually is, is hugely revolutionary. And, you know, if we think about, um, you know, the, the important role that retail investors have really played in driving this agenda to date all over the world. The idea that we are really going to make the system of distribution much more responsive to those underlying preferences and choices, I think is going to be an enormous driver uh, moving forward. Now, those two also, and I think we can get into it as well as we go on, are probably two of the areas that I think are enormously complex and that you know a, a lot of work needs to be done in or, across all corners of the industry um, regulators and supervisors to make sure that it lands in the way that we all want it to do that it, that it really achieves these goals but I, but i think they're you know hugely important and um I, I would dare say revolutionary i know it's a word that kind of um gets used maybe a lot in this agenda but they are incredibly revolutionary things uh for, for the investment market Brilliant. And we'll definitely be getting into the, the challenges and the complexities as we go on. That's a, that's a, a great intro, Kerry. Thank you. 
Nadia, I wonder if I could come to you next. Uh, it's a slightly different perspective from Bloomberg. Of course, you're not going to be directly regulated, is my understanding, under the proposals. But as a provider of data services, uh, what's your perspective? Where are you seeing the, the key moving pieces? Yeah, it's it's a good question. Actually, I, I would echo a lot of what the other panelists have said. Um, I think look, from a, a data vendor's perspective, our job is to equip our clients with the data they need to honour those regulations. I think from Bloomberg's perspective, the way we look at this is in two shapes. So firstly, the data needed to climate risk assess. And then secondly, the data needed to encourage and guide private capital to environmentally sustainable outcomes. Now, clearly, things like the taxonomy are really useful tools to help to do that. Um, but it would be remiss of me sitting in a Bloomberg seat not to also talk about the work of the, the task force on climate related financial disclosure. Um, so this was kind of at the request of the Financial Stability Board back in, I think, 2015, who were really looking at a clear, consistent approach to climate disclosure. And they had a really simple question here that are, what are the risks and how can we mitigate them? But they lacked any data in order to kind of answer the, those basic questions. So there's a voluntary framework that we've been working on that was released in 2017 um, that now has, has broader adoption. And you start to see things like the European Central Bank and other prudential regulators really focus on, on climate related disclosure. And where I think this is relevant as well for the taxonomy data set is when you start to think about adaptation. If you're making a claim that you're adapting, you need to have been able to climate risk assess your business. Um, so those are the places that that Bloomberg are really focused on here, Alyssa. Brilliant, thank you so much. Um, a quick reminder to the audience, you're very welcome to submit questions for our panel using the chat function. Uh, and I strongly encourage you to do so if there's anything that you want more depth on or if you feel that uh, you'd like a bit more explanation. So, so please do make use of that chat function throughout. So that's a really helpful uh, overview of where the key moving parts are and quite a lot of consistency between all of you, although obviously reflecting your, your, your unique perspectives. We're going to start talking a little bit more about uh, how your firms are preparing, what are the challenges, uh, and perhaps if you are able to share some of the ways in which you're working to overcome them. Uh, Karina, I'd like to come to you first. I wanted if you could share a little bit about how Electa is uh, working on the incoming sustainable finance agenda. I think, yeah, as I said, it's, it's quite massive, the, the, the things incoming. So uh, internally, I mean, it's been about getting on top of the new formalia in many senses. So it's involving a lot of more functions internally than in this dialogue. Uh, I mean, from compliance to the asset management and to, to everyone in between, sort of. Uh, but I think I want to raise two points that has been really, I think, helpful and important for us in this, uh, in this period up to now. It's the industry dialogue that we had locally with our peers. Uh, basically, um, a lot of it through the business associations for us, it's Insurance Sweden, but it's been very helpful. We had really candid and quite lively discussions on interpreting some of the impacts of the regulations, how we see, you know, the, the intention vis-a-vis -vis the, the consequences of certain things. And I think it's been fair to say that we definitely have had different interpretations that really uh, was meaningful to go through and, uh, and juggle between us. So I think in that sense, the industry dialogue has been very helpful and very open and constructive, I'd say. Uh, but it's, um, and in the ways we've been able to find common ground to contribute really to make, trying to make the regulations as good as possible, you know, from, from our experiences. Um, so I think industry dialogue has been one important thing. Um, which we've been able to take home also internally uh, to continue for ourselves. And then we've had a lot of discussions with ESG data providers, sell side analysts, our partners in the financial sector. Um, I mean, as asset owners, we're, we're, we're going to be one of the demand side of many of these uh, data products coming out. So it's been it's been important to us to see the development going on on that side and to encourage it and to pressure push it for, push a bit for it too uh, and I think that's also been an interaction that has helped us internally uh, when our analysts and PMs meet their peers uh, on the sell side for example and this is the topic on the agenda it really creates more attention it gets um, it gets more attention so I'd, I'd say those are, are two 
very practical things that we've been doing uh, to help sort of the internal process become on top of this, this agenda. Brilliant. Thank you, Karina. And actually, I might come to you with a, with a follow up. Um, so you're working in Sweden and you are navigating a, the interplay between uh, domestic Swedish regulation, which is often uh, more advanced or, or uh, even further ahead on some of these topics than at EU level. How do you um, navigate the interplay between EU and, and the Swedish approach? I, th I mean, for some of the, for some of the EU, uh, Swedish, oh, sorry, am I mute? <laughs> we can you can hear good good uh no no for, for some of the swedish uh sometimes sweden has been gold plating eu regulations i mean we've we've seen that to some extent and for example with the nfrd we have a larger scope of uh, of reporting entities etc but in terms of sustainable finance we've had a really strong tradition of self regulation so the broader financial industry there there has been i mean the insurance and fund providers have defined joint standards for reporting of carbon footprints in several years. We disclosed a lot of sustainability information in a sort of joint developed format um, developed by the industry to make it easier for end clients to actually compare uh, different ESG approaches or sustainability approaches or responsible investment approaches uh, between different funds. So I think these initiatives and these uh, where, where we come has sort of put us in a good position when it comes to these EU regulations. Uh, but it also means that we have sort of trial and error, some experiences that uh, I think can be useful to also feed into the EU process. Um, and also, I, I don't, I don't want to make it sound all Disney in Sweden, but we do have a pretty good dialogue with the regulators and policymakers. I mean, the Minister of Finance has had really wide and ongoing consultations with the sector. Uh, and we regularly sit down with the super advisory, supervisory authorities in, in, in trying to understand the different perspectives. So the self-regulation has had a strong foundation in, in our um, in our sector in our jurisdiction, but uh, but it's been pushed by policymakers uh, with sort of the overhanging in incentive of regulation. So, yeah. The carrots and the sticks. Fantastic. Thank you, Karina. Um, Johanna, I'd like to come to you next. Uh, so could you talk us through some of the some of the approaches your firm is taking, um, perhaps some of the challenges and, and uh, we have a very specific question on SFDR in the chat, which I might uh, ask you and Kerry to opine on uh, as, as, as you go through. So if I could hand over to you now. Sure, thank you. Well, I mean, you know, what we have done, of course, is to make sure we coordinate it. It's, it's important to know that CERG is an insurance company, so it's not only the investment geared regulation that is important to us, but also the insurance geared regulation and then, of course, everything about corporate governance. So we made sure that we bring together our legal team, our regulatory affairs team, our public affairs team, and then all the subject matter experts to, to understand this, um, especially when it comes to the EU action plan. Um, we've really, I mean, I had as much uh, interaction with our regulatory affairs team as never. And I think I've, you know, so we spent a lot of time training them up on vocabulary because we see what we use on an everyday basis in the industry is of course not necessarily what they have worked with so far and what they understand. And then also the regulator doesn't always use the industry vocabulary. So it takes a lot of interpretation of when I read the text, what I, you know, given the experience, think I understand the regulator means. And then if a lawyer reads it, that hasn't really worked deep um, in responsible investment, what they interpret. So that's been a very, very fruitful dialogue to bring everyone up to speed of what is the vocabulary we use, what is in the text, what do we use internally, and what do we think it actually means at the core, and then have those same discussions also, as Karina has said, with, with, with the industry. Um, we also worked a lot on, you know, making sure that we um, aggregate globally, because, of course, we don't only get questionnaires from the EU, we get it from from the US, we get it from Bermuda, we get it from Malaysia, we get it from Australia, and, and making sure that we also map where the different regulators stand, where we can transform 
forward-looking practices that we think we already deploy to some of the other countries, um, have a dialogue with the regulators there and make sure that we advocate for, for a certain harmonization and alignment where we can. That is something that we've really tried to do. And we build those structures first internally to then be able to, to bring them bring them back into all the industry and regulatory discussions we have. And I think that's one of the most important things that I guess is a, a, a blessing if taken up is that the EU has consulted various times and we've really tried to involve ourselves from the beginning. But I guess not all of the messaging is coming through. So I guess it's good that regulatory approaches pose a challenge to us to see if we can comply. And if not, really make a very strong argument of what is practical and what isn't and what simply takes more time or more data or more effort and what is taking us into a potentially wrong direction if we get back to the question of what do we actually want to achieve. And I think as long as this dialogue goes into both directions, it can be fruitful. If we lose that balance, uh, we can get into some you know, unintended consequences. Um, but, but again, I think it's very good to just have those discussions and, and be honest about them. Brilliant. Thank you, Johanna. Uh, Kerry, I'd like to ask you the same question around how your firm is, is, is beginning to prepare and, and perhaps some of the challenges that you face as, a, as, a, as an international firm. Um, but what I'll then do, I think, is ask some of these more specific questions about the regulation on sustainability disclosures. This seems like a, a good point. So if you could give us your kind of high level perspective on how you're preparing and then maybe we'll dive, dive into the detail after that. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, we have a pretty significant implementation project underway uh, across the firm. And, and I would caveat this by saying, obviously, a, a firm of our size has the resource to, to, to really have an extensive compliance project around this. Um, and I would say that that has been uh, very critical for us. This is an enormous undertaking for, for an asset manager. Um, I think that one of the challenges we've faced um, has really been um, clarity over exactly what requirements we will be implementing. Um, one, I think that's something that we've all faced. I, I've compared this many times internally. It feels very much like you're kind of paving the road as you drive down it at high speed. Uh, when you think of the complexity and scale involved in an implementation project for a large diversified asset manager, um, the SFDR requires you to update your prospectuses, kids, fact sheets, websites, general marketing material. So just to give you a sense, We've got over 600 funds, uh, ETFs funds in Europe, all of which are distributed in upwards of 20 countries in about 14 different languages. Um, we're talking easily into the hundreds of thousands of pieces of paper that, that need to be redone to comply with the SFDR. Um, that has considerable complexity, not just from a, a kind of get it done internally. And again, we're, we're lucky that we have the centralized resource to really build kind of compliance level platforms from kind of in, in investment risk management platforms up to products and, and, and through to disclosure. Um, but one thing I think doesn't get enough attention in this debate is this is not just a huge lift for firms. It's significantly complex for supervisors as well. Um, and to your question about, you know, what, what is the, um, you know, the, the, the challenge for an international firm? I, I think it's less about being an international firm so much as it is being a cross-border firm. Um, and I think that if you're a firm that's active cross-border and you deal with multiple regulators and supervisors in Europe, this becomes an exponentially more complex project. So things like prospectuses, um, kids, a lot of these are subject to pre-approval by, by supervisors. So when you think of you know, the amount of repapering that not just BlackRock is going to have to do, but literally the entire market in a very condensed time frame, you know, there are certain supervisors that are going to be inundated with, with requests, and some have started to think about you know, exactly how they're going to manage this. Um, others, I think, are, are getting there. Um, and then you've got countries with complexities around pre-approval of local marketing documentation. And, and the big ones are France, um, Spain, and, and Belgium from our perspective. So, um, you know, the cooperative exercise of getting this done, um, you know, that requires, you know, input from not just, you know, asset managers, but asset owners as well. We also have to think about our clients' requirements in terms of implementing this, and they'll be turning to us to, to help them manage as well. Um, but also just bringing together the very, different in many ways moving parts of different supervisory interpretations, um, different supervisory processes for just getting the paperwork done, um, and, and it becomes very complex. 
Thanks for that, Kerry. Um, so I thought we'd spend a minute on a couple of the very specific questions we've been having on the regulation on sustainability disclosures, because it's already uh, something that we, we've started a dialogue on. And I'm, I'll invite the panelists to decide if they want to chip in on these questions or not. So please just unmute yourself and, and step in. The first question, and this is extremely practical, uh, the regulation defines different categories of fund, the so-called Article 8 and the Article 9 products. And I'm wondering, um, or, or what our audience is asking is, is if you could give some insights on, on how you're deciding which products fit into which bucket, and perhaps for the wider audience, would anybody like to step in and just give their interpretation of what those Article 8 and Article 9 funds uh, are, mean or, or are trying to do? Um, I, I'm happy to step in as the asset manager if that's uh, if that's helpful. I mean, looking at it from a product perspective. <laughs> um, I mean, listen, I, I think that the SFDR is, taking a step back, actually, I, I think the SFDR is, is a fantastic piece of regulation in one sense, um, in one sense, but, but, but I mean, in this particular sense that I'm about to say, in the sense that I think that a regulatory framework that requires someone who makes some sort of sustained, sustainability related claim at the product level to substantiate it and justify it is excellent and i think it is actually sorely needed in the market um and i think that you know if we get this right it will be uh, of enormous long-term benefit to the growth of this market so generally speaking what the sfdr does is segments off products into those that make esg related uh, was it, they call it esg characteristic products with esg characteristics versus products with dedicated sustainable investment objectives and i guess you know a kind of uh, uh to 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 borrow Johanna's observation of, you know, the, there's a way in which we talk about these in the business that don't always align up to how you kind of translate them into text. A very loose way of looking at that would be kind of like impact products, products that that have um, as their investment objective a dedicated sustainability related outcome on one hand, versus those that build some sort of ESG characteristic orientation or you know even like exclusionary concept into the investment strategy and. I think that's kind of our starting point in terms of how we start to, to look at the different products we offer and figure out what falls where. Now, I think where this is going to get interesting is at the margins, right? I, I think when you look at certain products, you can say it's very clear that this belongs there and this belongs there. But I think there's a lot of kind of gray area. And, and this is where, you know, stuff like, say, the taxonomy, I think, is going to add to some some clarity around this. Um, and so certainly in, in my, my intro remarks, I say it's, it's probably... Um, you know, a, a really significant tool for asset owners to make asset allocation decisions. But as it builds and as it starts to dovetail with some of the, the SFDR type requirements, I think it becomes really critical for asset managers to be able to kind of clarify products. And that has, um, I think, probably a bigger impact for the retail market than necessarily institutional, because when we work with an institutional client, um, you know, in, in, say, a separate account or something, I mean, whatever whatever they want is whatever they want, right? It's, it's, um, uh, it just gets a little bit more complex. And I think you have to um, add a, a standard of, of harmonization and clarity when you're dealing with pooled products for, for the retail market. Um, but I, I mean, that's my high level take of where those categories go. But like I said, I think, you know, one of the challenges here is, um, you know, the potential for different supervisors uh, and different firms to take different interpretations of where some of the gray area is between some of those products. Thank you. Would anybody else like to come in on that? Karina, you've got a comment you'd like to make. I, I, I think I can offer something in, in contrast to what Carrie is, is uh, talking about, because to ask me, we have basically one, one product or it, it's managed in one uh, portfolio. But so, and, and we're occupational pension manager, so we're, we're kind of having a mainstream portfolio, but invested in a very responsible way with some features that we really want to pursue in terms of climate, etc. And uh, it has been, it's really about the gray areas that Carrie's alluding to, because it seems so simple for us then to just, you know, decide where we are. But our portfolio contains elements of you know, pure sustainable or impact investment. It does contain, uh, for, for the large mandates, we, we do pursue, you know, equality uh, objectives and, uh, and climate is an overall portfolio uh, goal. So it's it's been very difficult to us to understand, you know, if what, what are the commitments that we're going to have to make uh, to pursue that Article 8 sort of category for our product. Uh, 
Um, and for a while, I think many of our peers were considering not classifying ourselves as a product eight or nine category either way, but then realizing that anytime we would inform our clients, which we of course want to do on what our practices or how we do ESG in the analysis or how we do these things, then we automatically, uh, as we understand and interpret it, becomes an Article 8 product. So I think uh, those are some of the things that we've really been discussing in the industry dialogue that has been very helpful to us. But I still think there is more clarification to, to be had. I would agree with this if, hey, right, because from an insurance perspective, um, that is different. In some countries, we have a few asset management products. We have a lot of unit link products. And sometimes those are very specific funds, which we either manage and design in-house or through an external asset manager. So there we really speak product. But a majority of our life insurance business is fundamentally underlaid by one portfolio, similar to what Karina just talked about, pensions. And it's multi-asset and it has been responsible for years. But our responsible investment strategy is a combination of, you know, everything ESG integrated plus a couple of selective exclusion screens plus active ownership on top and an impact target and a net zero target. How are we supposed to explain this? I mean, explaining is not the issue, but but fitting it into Article 9 or 8 when saying there are also, it's, it's very, very vague at this point in time to people that have been in the industry for years um, because it also doesn't have thresholds. So if you make the impact claim, what is the threshold? Can it be a big impact claim of part of the portfolio or does it have to be the pure portfolio? So we're talking only you know, infra debt portfolios or private equity portfolios or dedicated green social sustainability bond portfolios, nothing else. At this point, this is unclear. Also in ESG integration, you have parts of also the technical standards that say, yeah, those are all the ESG type products and we want it to be very broad so everyone can make their own argument of why, which is great. And then at a different part and paragraph in the technical standard, the draft, it says, oh, this cannot simply be ESG integration. Article ESG integration should be standard. It has to go above and beyond that. So which one is it now? So those are exactly those vaguenesses where you could think it might have been on purpose for the market to kind of self-organize and you know make your own claim, back it up, and then you're good because what we focus on is the transparency. But at the same time, you have a lot of indication in the actual text that that is not what is meant. But then they don't give you thresholds or guidance. So I think this is a piece of legislation and, and I'm really with Kerry in content and in what is this bias to, it's revolutionary, it's a great step forward. But in how it's actually implemented, I'm afraid that's one where the timing, the deadlines and even the order that investors are asked to report before the underlying companies are asked to report the data through NFRD, um, where consultations were maybe the draft, the big text, the regulation will for sure enter into force in March. But then all the technical standards we need to have all the guidance of what we're supposed to do might come half a year later and have more time. This really got mixed up and uh, it's giving us a lot of headaches. And also, you know, realizing that we're talking to retail customers who are very, very important and who need that guidance but especially thinking about how complex the taxonomy is. And it's also such a wonderful document. It's absolutely clear we need to tackle, you know, category by category, and it takes time to build. But then we pick partial information, and the first audience we put it in front to is the retail investor. Without having all that knowledge that we probably have, we also really need to take this as an opportunity to, to make sure that we give them the right context, because if that detailed information is not delivered with the right context also there the reaction to the information could go very you know very sideways or create a lot of unintended consequences and i'm sometimes not sure whether all of that has been taken into account so this is where the industry dialogue and and reporting back and, and giving the feedback of you know what works and what doesn't in which order is very important but then of course we need to hope that, that the regulator appreciates that information and then adapts to it to make sure the entire thing is delivered um in in in, in the right order to really achieve what we actually want to achieve with it Fantastic, Joanna. Thank you. And, and I'm sure many of those on the line will appreciate hearing about some of the challenges. And, and it's not just their own perception. It, 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 there are some 
you know, very substantial challenges. Um, Nadia, I'd like to come to you next. We haven't heard from you in a while. Uh, we were going to talk about the broader data landscape. Obviously, this is something that you've thought very deeply on, but I'm wondering if you could also touch on some of the emerging data needs for the principal adverse impacts indicators under the SFDR. Um, so these are the entity level obligation to disclose on your adverse, in, on your adverse impacts on, on society and the environment and very cutting edge, very challenging. Uh, can you give us your take, please? Yeah, of course, Alyssa. And look, I, I mean, well done to the panel for taking the Article 8 and 9 uh, question. I recognise uh, the struggles involved in, in that. Um, so when I speak to clients about data, I think there are two main needs that emerge from the upcoming regulation. So first, as you touched upon, Alyssa, and I think as a question that's come in on SFDR, is how are firms expected to disclose information related to ultimately the 50 KPI? These are known as the principal adverse impacts. If 32 at the moment are mandatory, and then there's an optional two from a selection. Um, and as you mentioned, Alyssa, these are metrics like things, um, the existence of human rights policies, appropriate water uh, and waste management practices, key carbon metrics, and they're meant to evaluate investments made during a reference period. So not necessarily product specific, but anything you've bought and held over that reference period. Um, so Bloomberg, at the moment, we map public disclosure to those data points. Um, we have a coverage of, let's say, I think close to 85% global market cap in the data we collect from public disclosure. But I would say for these principal adverse impacts, the coverage varies a lot. And in some cases, for certain metrics, it's very sparse. Uh, the kind of questions I get related to the um, KPI that are currently published are, what do I do in the treatment of non-applicable? in terms of my numerator and denominator, like some of these things just aren't relevant to certain sectors that I'm investing in. Um, the other question that I get is related to non-disclosure. So in an ideal framework, what you want is non-disclosure to be treated less favorably. So if we take human rights policy, if I've disclosed I have a human rights policy, great, that's one of my metrics. If I am silent, we assume you do not have one. So we treat non-disclosure less favorably, thereby ideally encouraging disclosure. Now, some of those KPIs aren't treated that way. So there are, there are KPIs related to things like discrimination. So non-disclosure of discrimination is treated as I have no cases. That is treated favorably. And so the mix between favorable and unfavorable is something that I think people are really struggling in, as well as um, sparse data. I, and I'll probably couple that then with the taxonomy regulation, because the other thing that I hear is people starting to look at the taxonomy regulation. And yes, it's complex. And yes, there's a lot of pages to it. Um, but if I kind of break it down, so one of the first places you'd look at would be maybe mitigation. And mitigation is, is the impact a firm is having on the environment. So what I would look for is carbon intensity metrics, either of the production process or the emissions of the end product. So a really simple example here is the metric related to cars is they need to be less than 50 grams of carbon per kilometer. So in, in simple language, that's an electric vehicle. And so what I actually want to know then for the company I'm investing in is what percentage of revenue they make from the sale of electric vehicles. That's what I'm looking for as a metric. Um, now, I think there was a really good point made earlier by uh, Johanna around NFRD. And wouldn't it be great to rely on that? So that's an obligation for large European companies or international companies with European subsidiaries who will have to tell you the proportion of turnover capex or opex that aligns with the taxonomy. Yippee! We can all rely on that data. No, we can't. The timeline's not great. So, so there's also a problem with international companies. So if you're holding or investing in international companies, do you just deem them out of scope? Um, or do you perform the screening tests yourself? So these are the things I think people are, are grappling with, Alyssa. And, and if I may, I would also point on maybe three main areas of confusion I'm seeing as well related to that data and the availability of that data. Um, so the first I hear about it is, well, the taxonomy is only deep green, you know, so it's really difficult. There aren't many that will meet it. Um, I think that's wrong because I think credit is also given for transitioning and enabling activities. Um, the second thing I hear is, oh, well, it's always backward looking. 
like to do this, you need to look back. And I think that's only partially true. So obviously, CapEx and OpEx are forward looking metrics. So whilst you might choose to disclose on a revenue based model, which will look at historic ESG reporting, what your strategy could be is to say, well, I will only invest in companies with, let's say, um, greater than 20 percent of CapEx aligned to the taxonomy, which means over time your revenue model should grow. And then thirdly, and I hear this a lot, is, well, I can't do it. There's not enough data. Like if I wanted to perform an assessment myself, it's just not possible today. Um, my comeback to that would be, so in Bloomberg, we have built a prototype. Um, and I would say for the prototypes that we've built, if we just look at substantial contribution to mitigation in international companies, I would say probably 20 percent of them have enough information where I could do an assessment relative to the, the text recommendations. That's not 100 percent. And so one of the things particularly you'd mentioned earlier, the platform in usability, it's also getting people comfortable with a bucket of I don't know yet companies haven't disclosed i don't know yet so how do people treat the i don't know that 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 bucket uh, in terms of disclosure i think people always want to be perfect in their disclosure and transparent and honest and they certainly feel like the obligation is on them to get a complete set of data but right now that's not there ideally you'd get the taxonomy used as a tool that would encourage investors to speak with the investee companies um, both for these principal adverse impacts, but also related to the taxonomy. And actually what you'd find is if a lot of investors are speaking the same language to the investee company, then there's clarity about what we need to provide. And then the better the companies understand how they're being assessed, the more likely I think they are to share the relevant information. Um, and so one of the things often when I speak to corporates and we're encouraging more disclosure is they have this myriad of ESG questionnaires from, from data vendors, from investors, actually asking for a whole different slant on ESG data that they need to disclose. And it's really difficult for them to actually understand what are the meaningful data points. It's really expensive for them to honour all these requests. So I think corporates are going to be welcoming clarity on what are the more meaningful metrics, what are the more meaningful data points that they need to disclose so that there's consistency, um, I think, internationally rather than just within Europe. So I do believe that over time we're going to get there. But I do recognise that right now we're not there. Sorry, that was a very long winded answer. So I'll, I'll yeah. stop there. Not at all. Super helpful. Um, I'd, I'd like to just invite Johanna, Karina and, and Kerry to come in. If you have anything more you want to add on this principal adverse impact indicators, Johanna, you've already talked about it uh, to, to a certain extent. But if there's anything more you'd like to, to, to say on that topic, and then I think we're going to move on to discuss data a little more because we've had some really interesting questions in the chat around it. So if you'd like to just uh, step in, if you have further comments you'd like to make on that. Maybe just one comment to the principal adverse impacts to so exactly what Nadia just said. There are 50 indicators and what is really lacking on that list is a materiality assessment and filter. So uh, we're, we're still hoping that there is another opportunity to have that dialogue and go back on this list to, um, you know, with everyone who needs to be involved, have a look at it again to either, you know, to, to bring materiality in there. Because it's not only that the data is not there. And I'm completely with Nadia. I think all of us would... You know, both on the data we take in, we very much rely on, on quality and a certain amount of harmonization. And often it is best to ask the underlying company to say, what is material? Because if it is, you should be measuring it internally and tell me, but then you get, you know, many different ones. But we shouldn't, with all the burden on producing it, communicating it, collecting it, buying it, and then bringing it in and cleaning it on the investor side, we would be wasting a lot of resources if we forced everyone into everything that can be measured, which isn't material. So I really hope we can have that conversation to kind of bring it down or have a sector approach or whatever we do, but it should truly be material. And then the harmonization, we, we really welcome. And I think, I think what, your, um, what your points uh, spur is, is a realization of just how advanced the task is uh, that the European supervisors are trying to perform. They're trying to create comprehensive metrics of investor impact at an entity level that are um, readable to a, a consumer, to a client. Uh, it's an incredibly difficult job. And, and I think that complexity is, is one of the reasons that we've seen this delay 
um, through until the middle of next year to see those indicators in place and, and a great opportunity I think for leading investment practitioners to engage in that discussion and, and share what works and, and maybe what doesn't. Um, Karina, uh, do you have anything just, you'd like to add? I just want to sort of second what Johanna was saying. I think in this whole in the whole EU sustainable finance, I think what we've seen is that the lack of data is not a legitimate excuse to not pursue things that we need to be able to accept and live with so uncertainties and gaps of data for, for a while. But that shouldn't hinder sort of the ambition to really uh, look at adverse impact indicators. But I think from that perspective, the proposal that was out and for consultation, from our perspective, there were many of those suggested indicators that didn't necessarily wouldn't necessarily or wouldn't at all perhaps show adverse impact uh, from from an investment perspective. So I think one really needs to scrutinize sort of the quality and on that note, you know, not using sort of the excuse of lack of data, but really what do we know is an adverse impact? Can we can we start off with a smaller set of indicators that we know and then to develop the more sophisticated as we go along? And I think that's that's, I mean, obviously, that means that we're going to live with more movement in these regulations. But at the same time, I think it's so important to get it right as we are, as you alluded to, putting it out there for end customers to see and to make some sort of assessment of it. Thank you, Karina. Uh, Kerry, do you want to make a quick comment on this? We're running fairly. Quickly. Yeah, I would. I would love to. Actually, I, I would just say, um, you know, I, I think Nadia's. Uh, answer on 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 the data specifics and challenges and how you get through some of it was was perfect. So I, I've I've nothing really further to add to that aside from the fact that I, I think you know like I said that 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 um, we're we're all trying to work towards the same goal I think right in terms of um, getting better information and getting it there. I, the one thing I'd probably say and actually um, if it doesn't disrupt our timing too much, can I ask a question following on this back to Nadia um, for something of, of my understanding? Um, we talked a little bit in the Article 8, Article 9 product thing where I think that it's a slightly different question that an asset owner has to ask themselves versus an asset manager who has many products, right? Um, it's kind of a similar thing when you're talking about entity level principal adverse impact disclosure in the sense that it is conceptually framed, I think, in the way that when you're aggregating it across like whole portfolios, it makes more sense from an asset owner perspective. Um, I think when you look from an asset manager perspective, it would make far more sense to do it at the product level than it would at the entity level. Um, I mean, I, I do question what what decision useful information someone might get by aggregating all of the products that an asset manager single figure. It doesn't help you make a better choice of, of one product versus the other. And ultimately, to a great extent, your aggregate number as an asset manager is not entirely within your control it's within your your clients control as to how they make you know broader um, asset allocation decisions um, but my, my question is another one actually in the sense that a lot of these indicators are very much conceptualized around companies and company footprints and obviously regardless of whether you're an asset owner or an asset manager you're going to be looking at a lot of different asset classes um, so how, one of the, and this may be a provocative question but how do we treat sovereigns under a lot of this. I mean, sovereign exposure is an enormous amount of exposure uh, in most people's investment portfolios, and it's certainly in the asset owner side, be it pensions or insurance companies, but but also asset managers as well. H how do we aggregate some of these things together into, into single concepts that we can then kind of uh, uh, meaningfully bring together? A critical question, Nadia. I think this is going to be our last question, so feel free to take your. It's a horrible one, one Kerry. How dare you? Um, I'm sorry. I should have warned you. I'm sorry. It just came to me when we were talking about it. No, it's look. It's a. I think it's a very fair assessment of where we are right now, both for the taxonomy regulation and for SFDR. They are geared towards companies. Um, definitely something. So. So I, I'm lucky in that I am sitting within the usability space of the platform, um, you know, and there are considerations related to usability and we are considering them deeply. Things like, you know, sovereigns, things like international application, particularly for the taxonomy regulation that under do no significant harm points quite heavily to EU legislation. So, so what does that mean um, if you're wanting to apply that more broadly? Um, so I, I, I can only say I, I agree. Um, from a Bloomberg perspective, we haven't sought to create any any proxies outside of like formal guidance that we would get through 
you know, the platform, for instance, in terms of the treatment of sovereigns in, in these reporting frameworks. Um, I think in terms of assets, uh, the taxonomy tackles this quite well, I think, in the, you know, if the use of proceeds of that asset asset, sorry, uh, taxonomy aligned, then great, you know, you, you can make reference to that. Failing that, you can look at whether the issuer or the parent um, sells products and makes revenue associated to the taxonomy or aligned with the taxonomy. So you have kind of two, two cracks of the whip in terms of how you're going to be assessing your product kind of like a waterfall logic. I, I recognise under SFDR, it can be a challenge because you're just looking at what you're investing in over the course of a year. And I think really the aim is to say, are you considering principal averse impacts at the point at which you're investing in these companies? And, and largely, I think it will fall on a pre, you know, investee engagement due diligence process that says, do I have all this data? Clearly, because it's coming kind of midway through, we already invest in certain companies and we don't have complete data sets. What does that mean about me? It is challenging. Um, but I think moving forward, if every company you engage with provides key information and we make sure that we're not investing in, you know, companies that have human rights issues or have human rights issues, more importantly, in their supply chain, um, then I think that is really important. Thank you very much, Nadia. Um, I think we'll we'll start to wrap up the panel there. Um, before we do, I'd just like to mention a couple of other topics that are under discussion at the EMEA forum that may be of interest. Uh, one is that there's a panel focusing on the PRI's taxonomy practitioners group. These were investors who are working to implement the EU taxonomy in practice. And we've got some really interesting case studies there, again, very practically focused uh, and, and hopefully very insightful. Uh, and we also have a, a plenary panel on a legal framework for impact. This is the successor project to fiduciary duty in the 21st century. And we'll have a really high level discussion there about some of these evolving concepts around impact and outcomes and what types of ideas might need to be developed to, uh, to, to, to make the EU, uh, to, to take the EU to the next level there. With that, I would like to thank all of the panelists. Thank you all so much for your insight and, and your willingness to, to really dive into the detail. And also to thank the audience uh, for your participation and your attention. Uh, we're very, very grateful and uh, we hope to see you all soon in another session. Thanks very much, everybody, and goodbye. Thanks Thank you. Lot. Thanks, Alyssa.